You know, over the last few weeks, if you've been here, we've been doing this series called Why the Bible. And I really wanted to lay out for you why, as a church, all that we do, the foundation of what we do is to preach the Word of God. And if you remember, I said there's three reasons. The Bible is a source of truth that we can go to. And not just truth that reveals, you know, information for our minds. It's truth that reveals the person of Jesus Christ who is truth. We saw, secondly, the Bible is a source that has all that we need to be able to equip us to go out and live the Christian faith. But as we saw last week, and to me, the most powerful reason why the Bible, because it has the power to transform lives. And all of us here today that have given our life to Jesus know the transforming power that happens when we give our life to Him and the Spirit takes the Word of God and begins to bring change, change that we can never do on our own, only He could do through us. And I want you to keep that in the back of your mind because that three-week study that we did, it's really setting us up for the next several weeks where we're going to be going. And so if you have your Bibles, please turn to Matthew chapter 24. We're going to spend most of our day in that passage today. And while you're going there, you know, I look out in this crowd and I see people of different ages out there, right? But the one thing I know that we have in common, all of us utilize artificial intelligence every day, right? Or as they call it, AI. And it doesn't matter whether you're older or younger, most of us have used things like virtual assistants. You know, we talk into our phone to Alexa or our computers with Siri, whatever the case may be. And beyond that, many of us enjoy listening to music on Spotify or watching videos on YouTube. And you ever wonder how those playlists come? Those suggested songs or videos to watch? Well, that all happens through AI. And if you're looking at me and saying, well, I don't do any of that, I guarantee you've done the third one. You have all Googled something, right? All of us have Googled something. And we love to Google because when we Google something, guess what comes up? Those ads that we all love, right? And where do those ads magically come from? Well, you know what? They're generated from AI who's tracking your search history. So whatever you're searching on your history, the AI is going to pop up ads to be able to draw you and hopefully go and purchase whatever you don't need, right? That's the way it goes. And the thing about AI is that certainly we can all agree that it has provided some conveniences into our life. But AI is going at such a fast pace right now that there are many concerns, and one of the probably, I would say, one of the deepest concerns about AI right now is its ability to deceive and manipulate us. In fact, there's a term now that they call, it's called AI fake problem. And what that means is that now AI has the reality of being able to create fake websites. Yeah, sometimes you go to a website, it's not even true. Fake profiles, fake consumer reviews. So now next time you go buy something on Amazon, you don't know if it's true or not, right? Fake consumer reviews and even fake people. I think most of you are probably aware of something called deep fakes. This is a type of AI that creates convincing images, video, and audio that represents people saying or doing something that they never said or did. So this is where AI is taking us into this new realm, this new world. And we even have experts on AI. What they're saying to us is they're having problems themselves avoiding being deceived. They say that AI is progressing so fast it's blurring the line between what is real and what is make-believe. And so now what AI has done is rather than uh, answering questions, it's raising more questions. In fact, I like what one expert said in uh, computer science. This is their approach to where AI is taking us. They said the following. It's not a question of whether we can prevent AI from lying to us, but how we can prepare for AI deception when it occurs. Now, I know none of you guys came here today or hear a sermon today on artificial intelligence, but there's a reason why I brought this to you. Because I want you to see that quote up there. Because what this person is saying is so true. We have got to prepare ourselves, what? Against artificial intelligence deceiving us. But more importantly than that, there's a greater deception we have to be prepared for. It's a deception that goes deeper than trying to manipulate images or advertisements and try to, to deceive us with it. It is a deception that, listen, carries with it eternal consequences. Did you hear what I'm saying? A deception that will carry with it consequences that will transcend this life. What I'm going to be talking about over the next six weeks is what I'm going to refer to as a spiritual deception, the most dangerous deception that you or I will ever experience in this life. What we're going to do over the next few weeks this week, I'm going to look at the words of Jesus and how Jesus provides the warning for all of us about deception. I know today's going to be more informative, but I, you have to understand the warning before you can move forward. It's like me when I used to coach soccer. I'd warn my team, we're playing a good team next week. you got to be prepared. Or I'm warning my kids, like, don't do this or here's the consequences. What we're going to find is that God's word's going to warn you and I that, listen, you need to be serious. Take this serious because if you don't, you'll not be prepared how to deal with it. 
Then after we're done dealing with the warning this week, next week, we're going to look at the methods. What methods are being used right now to deceive you and I spiritually? When we go to week three, we're going to look at the details that are involved in what Paul says are, are part of what he calls the last day's deception. And we're going to see in that last day's deception that it's going to be much more intense than what we've seen right now with signs and wonders and miracles to deceive us away from the truth of who Jesus Christ is. Then week four through six, I'm going to take you to a book of Jude, which I've said from the very beginning, I was going to take you there. And for those three weeks, I want to accomplish two things. How we can be prepared to avoid being deceived ourselves, but more importantly, how can you and I contend for the faith? How can we stand for the truth of Jesus Christ and what the gospel says? And I didn't share this with the first service, but I'll share it with you. I was thinking, why, why, why is this so important to do a series on deception? Well, I'll give you why it's important for me. Because one day as a pastor, I'll stand accountable before the Lord, won't I? And he will say, how did you, what did you teach? Did you warn the congregation about what I said in my word about coming deception? And so I understand the divine calling that I have to warn you of not being deceived spiritually. But secondly, why it's beneficial for you is I have seen my, with my own eyes the devastation that comes through spiritual deception. I look out here, and I don't know whether you've been involved with something like this, but I know people right now, because they have walked into a church, and they expect that when I come to that church, I'm going to hear the truth. I may not agree with it. I may not like what they're going to say, but I expect they're going to give me the truth from what God's Word says, but they were deceived, and they were led away. Deceived of money, deceived of, 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 of other things about their own spiritual walk, and to this day, they will not step into a church because they say the church is nothing, but people will try to deceive, manipulate, and lie. And so the challenge is for all of you. To be able to prepare yourself, to know how to be to discern between what is true and what is false. And that's why we spend so much time in the Word of God. Because it's the Bible that guides and directs us towards the truth. So now we're going to jump into Matthew 24. And I would imagine most of you know this passage. It's a very familiar passage because when we think about Matthew 24, what comes to mind? What comes to mind is the details that surround Jesus Christ's return. So I'm sure in this room, if not all of you, most of you have probably asked that question. I'll be honest, I have asked it too. Jesus, when are you going to come back? Do you not see how the world is? It's getting worse. There's more violence. There's more evil. You promise you're going to come back. Why are you delaying? Well, we know from Peter, why does he delay? Out of his patience and mercy to draw all men, all women to salvation. But we still ask that question, like, why, when are you going to come back? What's going to be the, when, when are we going to know the season of your return? And look, at, I'm not here today to focus so much upon that or to give you dates. If I were to give you a date of Christ's return, guess what will happen? I'll be in that nice laundry list of people who have failed on predictions. Who tried to sell books, by the way, to make money off of it. That's not the purpose. But what we're going to look at is we're going to look at Jesus' conversation with the disciples because in this conversation, he is going to deal with his return. He's going to lay out four signs that he says to be aware of before he returns and sets his kingdom here on earth. And guess what the very first sign of that is? It is deception. So we're going to jump into Matthew 24 and look at verse 1 and 2. And I want to kind of lay out the, view, the details because I think we get so excited. We want to rush to the, to the point where Jesus starts talking about signs about his return. But you can't fully grasp what he's saying without understanding the context of why he's saying it. So this is what it says in verse 1 and 2, which we get four details that set the context for this chapter. This is what it says here in verse 1. It says, Jesus left the temple and was going away. When his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. So there's the context. Jesus with his 12 disciples, they are leaving or departing the temple. Now the temple in that context there was in Jerusalem. It was a central place of worship for the Jewish people. They would go here to sacrifice to God. They would go here for all the religious festivals to celebrate what that festival was about. But this is the place you'd go to if you wanted to experience what I would say the closeness to God within their perspective of how they worship God. So here they are, the disciples, they're leaving the temple, and as they're leaving, they look over to Jesus and they're like, man, look at how beautiful this temple is. Look at the buildings surrounding us. And there's quite a reason why they would say that, because the temple that was there when Jesus was alive is what we call the second temple, or Herod's temple. See, we know in the Old Testament, the very first temple was built by who? Solomon. But after disobedience and rebellion, God sends the nation of Babylon in, they destroy Jerusalem. They destroy the first temple. They are sent into exile, right? Babylonian exile. 
But God had promised the people of Israel that he would not forsake them. He brings them back into the land. And under the leadership of a guy by the name of Zerubbabel, they begin to rebuild a new temple. You can read the book of Ezra. It gives you all the details of that. And then as the temple was continually needing to be rebuilt, a guy by the name of Herod the Great expands and restores the second temple, which is why we often refer to it as Herod's temple. Now please understand, historically speaking, why Herod is called Herod the Great. It's not because he was a great person. He was a great builder. He loved to build lavish buildings that would be monuments of his legacy. And so when he saw this temple needed to be repaired and needed to be, you know, renovated, he got 10,000 men to work on it. And what he did was he had these men construct this temple with marble, with gold and white limestone. And at the time of Jesus, it was one of the most oppressive buildings in all the ancient world. In fact, the Jewish historian Josephus, he gives us an eyewitness account of what this temple looked like. This is what he says. The exterior of the building lacked nothing that could astound either mind or eye. To approaching strangers, it appeared from a distance like a snow-clad mountain. For all that was not overlaid with gold was of purest white. So you get the context. Jesus with his disciples, they're leaving this place of worship, the temple, and they're, mat- they're looking at the beauty of the temple. Then we go to verse 2 because Jesus is going to give us our final detail of our passage. And this is what it says. But he, referring to Jesus, answered them, You see all these, do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. So as the disciples are, are, are marveling over the beauty of this temple, the place where they worship, what has Jesus given us? The next detail, this temple is going to be destroyed. Just imagine for one moment for a second, the very place where you go and worship, the place where you feel the closeness to God is somehow going to be destroyed. And what we find out is that Jesus was 100% accurate about his prediction. Forty years later, the Roman general Titus conquered both Jerusalem And in the process of conquering Jerusalem, he destroyed the temple. And what's interesting is that they destroyed the temple. You know what the Romans did? They set the temple on fire. And through those fires, all these gold and silver ornaments that were all over the temple, they began to melt. And as they melted, guess where the gold and silver went? Into the cracks of every single one of those temple stones. And so what the Roman soldiers did when they were done conquering the temple, they took the temple stone by stone to extract the gold and silver. Just as Jesus said, literal fulfillment, word to word of Jesus, what he said about the temple. And what's interesting today, all you'll find is that. This is all that's left of Herod's temple. It's actually a retaining wall. It's called the Western Wall. They sometimes refer to the Wailing Wall. Why do they call it the Wailing Wall? Because the Jewish people go there every day to pray for the Messiah to come. It's the last monument to Herod's temple. And I remember, I've seen it a few times, but the first time I saw it, it was just overwhelming. And there's two things that I took away from that about what we need to know about God. Number one, God is holy and just. God will not tolerate sin. How can I expect a judge on this earth to allow people to get, go free and not be held accountable, but yet I expect the exact opposite from from God himself. God is holy and just. That means there's a consequence for their sin. And that wall there is a reminder that they had rebelled against God. They had walked away. They had rejected Jesus. So that's a monument to say, this is what happens to unfaithfulness. But you know what that wall is also a reminder of? Not just God is holy and just, but God is faithful and true to his promises. God said, I will will come back and I will restore the nation of Israel back. And that wall is a reminder that he will remain faithful to his promises. And I don't want you to lose sight because sometimes we get caught up in the historical details. But this is something that's speaking into our own lives. Look, we've all wandered from the Lord, right? We have those moments where we've lost sin into our life. And we can't mock God to think that I can do whatever I want and somehow there's no consequences. Because God is holy and just and he will hold you accountable. The beauty of it is when you come to him, you know what he is to you? He's like a father who lovingly disciplines you to get back on path. But more than that, God is also faithful. Just thinking about that girl who had been in the hospital for 30 days. 30 days sitting there wondering, will the baby be born? What about my own health? Those 30 days, what did God show? He is faithful to who he is. And right now, maybe you're going through a difficult time, but I'm going to tell you something. You need to hold on to the promise of who God is and what he has told you in his word and know that he will stand true to that. We move on here to verse 3. 
Now that we've got all the details in place, we have the disciples walking with Jesus. They're admiring the temple, and Jesus comes out of nowhere and says, Hey, by the way, this beautiful temple you see, this place of worship is going to be destroyed. I can only imagine the questions going through the disciples' mind that be going through mine. And we see here in verse 3 some of the questions the disciples begin to ask Jesus. And this is what it says. And he sat on the Mount of Olives. And I want to stop right there because I know I've given you some details, but it's so important to understand the significance of the Mount of Olives. First of all, if you've been to Jerusalem, the Mount of Olives is the mountainside. It overlooks the city of Jerusalem. And when you're up in the mountainside, you can only see Jerusalem. You can see the temple. So here's Jesus sitting on the mountainside with his disciples, and they're about to ask this question, but please understand the significance. Things don't happen in the Bible by random chance. There's a reason why Jesus is sitting there, because that place has such biblical significance. It was the place on the, during the, um, the Palm Sunday when Jesus came out from the, from the Mount of Olives into Jerusalem. This is the place that after they had the Last Supper, Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane, which is on the Mount of Olives, and he did what? He went to the Father to prepare what? Salvation for you and I. And then after he died and rose again from the grave, where did he go before he ascended to heaven? He went to the Mount of Olives. And this is also, biblically speaking, too, where the second coming of Jesus Christ will occur. The prophet Zechariah, chapter 14, verse 4, says the Messiah will come and his feet will touch on the Mount of Olives. A very significant place. So at this place of significance, Jesus sits in the Mount of Olives. The disciples come to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? The disciples ask him two specific questions. Question one, when will these things be? In other words, when is the temple going to be destroyed? The second question, which is the question that many of you and I have asked, What will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? Specifically for the Jewish mind, what they meant by that is, when are you going to reveal that you're the Messiah? When are you going to come and establish the Messianic age to restore Israel back to its glory? Because remember, at the time that Jesus is speaking to them, they're under Roman occupation. And for the disciples, these two events were connected together. And they were anticipating what? Any moment, Jesus is going to announce, I am the Messiah, I'm here to establish my kingdom. And of course, if you read the rest of chapter 24, Jesus is trying to remind them, now is not the time. And what we're going to do here is we're going to look at how Jesus answers the second question, because what he does is he answers question number two first. And as you go to verse four through eight, the way that Jesus answers this question is he's going to lay out signs that are going to become before he returns and establishes his kingdom. And so this is what he says. And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ or I am the Messiah. And they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed for this must take place. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of birth pains. What we're going to do for our rest of our time today is I'm only going to focus upon that first sign, deception. But before I do, I just want to make two points about these four signs. First of all, these signs describe the condition of human history. Deception, famine, earthquakes, war, all these have defined human history, haven't they? So when Jesus ascended into heaven, he's saying these signs are always going to be with us. It's a reality of human existence. But beyond the fact that they're part of human history, what does Jesus say? He says that, this is the second point, these signs will increase in frequency and intensity the closer we get to Jesus' return of the second coming. Do we see that going on in our world today? Yes, we do. Yes, I know there's been wars and famines and earthquakes and all that stuff has happened, but we see an intensity. We see a frequency. I was just doing a little bit of background research, and right now there are over 30 armed conflicts happening worldwide. Probably the one that comes the most to your mind is what's going on in Ukraine and Russia. You talk about wars and rumors of wars, we're on the, we're on the, the step of that turn into a, a, a World War III. We see China ready to attack Taiwan. We see North Korea threatening with nuclear weapons. All these wars and rumors of wars, exactly what Jesus said, will come before I return. And they will get what? More intense and more frequent. What about earthquakes? Yes, we've seen earthquakes throughout history, but we see earthquakes at a higher level of this devastation we've ever seen. Just recently, there was that earthquake in Morocco where thousands of people were either injured or killed. And how about famine? 
Right now, according to one source I read, 45 million people in 37 countries right now are facing starvation. And they do not have access to food like you and I have today. And it's not just the fact that Jesus talks about these signs. He says they're going to increase in frequency and intensity. In fact, in verse 8, this is what he says. He compares these signs to birth or labor pains. Just as labor or birth pains become more intense and frequent, the closer you get to the baby being born, what Jesus is saying, these signs will increase in intensity and frequency the closer we get to Jesus' return. And the first sign that Jesus says we're going to see both an increase in frequency is deception. Now I want to make sure I qualify. I'm not here telling you that Jesus Christ is going to come back tomorrow or next week. No one knows the day or the hour. But what I will tell you is that we have to understand the season. When Jesus talked about end time events, there was one thing that he mentioned. It all focuses upon the nation of Israel. And for many years, people laughed and mocked and said, come on, the Bible's true? Because why? For many years, there was no nation called Israel. But in 1948, because of the Holocaust, what happened? God brought the nation back. And now all of a sudden, this nation, where all these prophecies are going to surround this nation for Christ's return, they're now back in the land. We have never seen in human history a nation lose its language, lose its identity, lose its land, and come back like the nation of Israel. All because God promised it would happen. So I believe that the season's upon us. But because the season's upon us, does not mean that I stop working, I stop doing what I am. I should be more motivated for live for Christ because what I realize, he may come back in my lifetime and I pray he does, or he may not, but it doesn't change the way that I live for him to stay faithful to what he's called me to do. But let's go back to that first sign, deception. This is what Jesus talks about in verse 4 and 5. He says, see that no one leads you astray. We all know that the Bible was written, the New Testament, should I say, was written in Greek, so I want to give you two Greek words. The first Greek word is, what does the Greek word see mean? It means to take heed, to be aware, to watch out. The second Greek word is lead astray, and that can either mean to be deceived or to wander off course. So what is Jesus doing for you and I right now? He is warning, first of all, his disciples, but he's warning you and I. He's saying, be aware, watch out. For what? That you're not led astray, you're not deceived. Jesus is very clear about what he's saying to you and I. It's not a suggestion. It's not like this could happen. He is warning us. It's like you see a person about to walk off a cliff and you're warning, hey, watch where you're going. You're going to fall and it's dangerous. You could, you could do serious damage to you. You're warning them to get off the path that they're on. Jesus right now is warning you and I about deception that is going to come. And it's going to come with much more frequency and intensity the closer we get to his return. That's what this whole sermon today is about. It is preparing you. Like I said, no matter what I say for the rest of this series, if you don't understand the significance of the warning, then you won't feel there's any need to respond to the warning. Can you imagine? Someone says, hey, you know, you need to start preparing for some natural disaster. You're like, come on, natural disaster? It's never happened here before. But all of a sudden, they begin to keep warning and warning and warning and giving you signs about the fact it's coming. What do you do? You start to prepare. That's what Jesus wants you and I to do. He wants us to be prepared for his return. So we go to verse 5, and not only does Jesus say, see that no one leads you astray, but he's going to give us more details about this deception. He says, for many, not just few, will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, I am the Messiah, the anointed one, and they will lead many astray. Is this sign happening in our lifetime today? Yes, it is. Has it happened throughout history? Yes, it has. But we see a frequency, we see intensity of people trying to lead other people away from who Jesus Christ is, trying to give another definition of who Jesus Christ is, trying to say that they are Jesus Christ. I'll give you two examples right now. Two people today of, of many who claim that they are the Messiah. And you'll see that they are deceiving many to follow them. The first one is Vissarion, which is the teacher. He's referred to as Jesus of Serbia. He founded the Church of the Last Testament. He dresses like Jesus, as you can see on the screen, and he claims that his real mother is the Virgin Mary. He has over 10,000 followers, and most of them live in the woods of Serbia. And at least the last time that I had read this article, he got in trouble with the law, is in prison, but they're still following him. Another person here is Apollo Quibaloi. He refers to himself as the appointed son of God. He makes the claim that he is without sin. 
You must have not read 1 John, right? For those of you who remember that series. He says he's without sin, and he says he's the most righteous person in the world. I'm not sure if he's married, because I'd like to talk to his wife about that one, right? <laughs> but listen, this is the thing that's scary about it. He has a large church in the Philippines where the claim is they have over 6 million followers. Jesus warns us, before I return, many false prophets claiming to be the Messiah, and they will deceive many. And I want you to understand, because I've talked a lot about end time events, and people want to talk about all these other signs, but the one that we often miss is deception. And this is so important to what Jesus is trying to instruct them, because as you go through Matthew 24, this is the sign that he comes back and repeats two more times. In fact, in verse 11 of chapter 24, he says this, And many false prophets will arise and lead or deceive many astray. The key point here is Jesus wants us to understand the extent of this deception. As this deception continues to grow, it's not going to be in some isolated, you know, remote area. What he's saying is going to be a global reality because you have many people claiming this and many are going to follow and be deceived. He goes on to say this in verse 24 of chapter 24. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. The key point here is the influence of this deception. Because what does he say? He says, you're going to see signs. You're going to see miracles and wonders that will be so influential, so intense, that if possible, those who truly know Jesus Christ, they, if possible, they can walk away. This is a significant point. I'll make reference to this later on in our study. Does Jesus, did he do miracles when he was here on earth? Yeah. Do we still see miracles by God today? Yes, we do. But I think the danger of this is, is so many people think that if I see a miracle, if I see a sign or wonder, that it's from God. And Jesus is telling us right now that signs and wonders in themselves does not mean it's from God. That it can actually be used to deceive you to walk away from the truth of who I am. So we see just in these extra verses the extent of this deception, but also the influence of this deception. And Jesus is not the only one in Scripture who warns us about deception. Every single author of Scripture refers to it. I'll give you two examples. One is from the Apostle Peter. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. He says, But false prophets also, also excuse me, arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies. What's the point we're getting from Peter? He's saying the deception is not going to come outside. We're to be clearly visible by someone who says, I deny Jesus Christ. I don't want anything to do with the church. He said, that's not where the deception is. He says, what? The deception will come from within the church. It'll come in secretly. It'll come in by stealth. When our study of Jude, we'll see Jude warn us about this. They come unnoticed. They crept into the church. That's where the deception happens, ladies and gentlemen. That's why I'm so passionate about this, because I realize the danger of what we're facing. We also see, besides the fact that the deception comes from within the church, the Apostle John says this about deception. This is 1 John chapter 2, verse 26. He goes, I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. What he wants us to understand, this deception is what? It is intentional. This deception by these people is not for your better, for what's best for you spiritually. Like, oh, I really care about you and I really want to see you do well. No, this deception is intentionally designed to what? To deceive you from the truth. And there's so much examples of that today. I see on television. I see in so many churches where this deception comes within the church with the intention to pull you away from who Jesus Christ is. So God's word has really warned all of us today about deception. But I want you to understand over the next few weeks, the goal here is not just to be warned. It's great that I've warned you, right? Thank you. But in warning, the key is not just being warned, but how do I prepare to deal with deception? That's the end game, right? Thank you that you've warned me, but what do I need to do? How do I take the steps? I can warn you about a coming natural disaster, but warning you does not prepare you, right? There are steps that have to be taken because the Word of God says to us, in light of all this deception, we are to be on our guard. We are to test all things. And as we'll see in the book of Jude, we are to contend for the faith. And I was very clear. Two reasons why I feel this is so important. For me personally, one day I'll stand accountable before the Lord. And he'll say, were you a watchman for me? 
Did you warn your congregation about the deception that I had warned you in the word of God? But secondly, it's for you as well. That you will know how to decipher between truth and error. That you will avoid what I've seen so many in people's lives today, walking away, being deceived to the point they won't even walk into a church anymore. So where does this begin? I'll be quite honest, it does not begin with me. It begins with Jesus Christ. Because what I'll say over the next few weeks will not mean anything to you if you don't know this and need to know this. You need to know the voice of Jesus Christ. Jesus said it very well in John chapter 10, verse 27. He says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Think about sheep. They have no ability to defend themselves or protect themselves from wild beasts. They don't have claws. They don't have teeth. They can't run fast. So how in the world can they protect themselves? There's only one way. They have to trust and listen to the voice of their shepherd. In fact, the sheep has become more acquainted with their shepherd. They will only listen to the voice of their shepherd and not to any other voice. I saw a video on YouTube. You need to go watch it. It's these young people who were going up and they were doing a test. They said, call the sheep in. One person after another, calling the sheep in. Come on, you know, and they're, whatever words they're using. Then the shepherd walks up and he calls the sheep and they come to his voice. See, to avoid deception, we have got to know the voice of Christ. How do I know the voice? There's two things that have to happen. One of them is you have to go to the cross because at the moment of the cross is where you trust that voice. You realize what that voice is one who gave his life for you and says, look it, there's only one way for you and I to have a relationship and that relationship is through my sacrificial death because that death provided what? It provided forgiveness for your sin, the very thing that has separated us. Then as I trust that voice, what do I do? I follow that voice. The only way you can follow that voice is you have to know your word, the word of God and spend time in prayer with the Lord. You see, the reality is we're all going to face dangers and threats in our walk with Christ. In fact, Jesus said in Matthew 7, 15, he says, beware of false prophets, those who deceive you, right? Because they come disguised as harmless sheep, but they're vicious wolves. In other words, Jesus says even any church right now, there are what? Wolves in sheep's clothing. They're trying to deceive you. They're trying to lead you away. They're trying to destroy your faith. This is why you must know my voice, but here's the beauty of it. It's not just knowing the voice, but knowing where the voice is going to lead you. Because as our good shepherd, Jesus is going to protect us. He is going to keep us safe from vicious wolves. And I love what Jesus says, because after John 10, 27, this is what he says in verse 28. He goes, I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. That's the beauty of his voice. We are not following Jesus just for what? To avoid being deceived. We're following Jesus because it leads to eternal life. And what greater voice to follow today than the voice of the one who gave his life for you? So as we go through this study on deception, I go back to that question. Do you know the voice of Jesus Christ? Do you hear it? Do you listen to it? Is it what you seek every single morning as you open up your word of the Bible, as you spend time in prayer? Because it's that voice as you listen to Christ through Scripture where you can avoid being deceived. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you so much for the fact that your word not only warns us, but it prepares us on how to deal with those warnings. And God, I know how much the depth of love that you have for all of us. You are the good shepherd. You care and protect your sheep. And Lord, you are warning all of us today to avoid deception that will grow more intense the closer you come back. And I pray for all of us, Lord, that our hearts and our minds will be open for the next few weeks. That as much as I hope they gain information, Lord, what I hope and pray is that this series is a confirmation in all of us that we know the voice of the Good Shepherd and that we listen to it. Guide and direct our steps, Lord, and be present in all that you've called us to do. In Jesus' name, amen.